Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the Freight Mobility Research Institute webinar series co-hosted by the WTS FAU student chapter. I am Adini Machado, the president of WTS at FAU and graduate research assistant at the FMRI at FAU. Today, we have the pleasure to hear from Josette Severin, who is going to present to us about multimodal transportation planning. Today, Valentina will introduce the speaker. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar. I'm Valentina Pucuz, the Vice President of WTS FAU Student Chapter. And we will also feature Elaine Machado, the President for the Chapter, who will address all of your questions at the end of this presentation. So Josette Severin is a Senior Mobility Planner with a passion and enthusiasm for active living, health, safety, and transportation. Her experience in transportation research, policy, planning, and public health spans across the private and public sectors to research institutions and nonprofit agencies. Currently with Broward County, Josette was formerly the Vision Zero Coordinator for the City of Fort Lauderdale. And Ms. Severin's presentation will review some of the latest multimodal trends and practices in transportation planning, while also describing how multimodal transportation planning health and safety are interconnected. So at this time, Josette, you have the floor. Thank you, Alina and Valentina. Good afternoon, I'm Josette Severin, and I'm excited to talk to you all today about multimodal transportation. So let's, let's dive into it. I'm gonna start our presentation with the definition of multimodal transportation to set us up with some context. A multimodal is defined as one as more than one travel mode, including potentially the four highway modes, auto, bus or transit, pedestrian and bicycle, aviation, rail, and seaports. Today I'm going to focus more on the four highway modes um, and the movement of people. So when we start to think about space, and how many users we can fit and move in our limited space on roadways, we can start to think about how we can move people more efficiently. We can start to focus on the different types of modes we can accommodate in different contextual settings, from natural and urban to rural and other classifications like suburban. With our growing populations in South Florida and increasing densification, we need to continue to enhance our multimodal transportation system in order to continue, continue efficiently moving people and facilitating productivity as our densities in urban form evolve over the decades. And as we think about our limited space and as we increasingly urbanize, we have to reevaluate whether our current performance, me performance measures are providing us with an accurate picture of our performance. Over the last 20 years, there has begun to be a shift in perspectives and priorities. With multimodal federal, state, and local policies, people are looking at ways to better evaluate the quality of service our transportation system provides. We look at accessibility, mobility, connectivity. These are the big concepts that are fundamental to moving people in a safe and efficient way. Vehicular level of service is just one of the pieces in this big puzzle. Developed in the 1950s, level of service is one of the primary performance measures for our roadway. These are metrics that we have codified into our local comprehensive plans and state law. However, there are policies that exist that ensure our partners, such as FDOT, work with local governments like Broward County to establish appropriate level of service targets for multimodal mobility and system design, where the targets shall be responsive to all users for context, roadway function, network design, and user safety. So taking a closer look at level of service and with current conversations, people have questioned whether the emphasis on level of service and vehicular speed may be counterproductive to our multimodal safety priorities. And as we look at level of service A, 
in the upper tiers of level of service, we may assert that these are not always positive indicators of performance but may rather be viewed as maybe indicators of too much capacity, faster or in more dangerous speeds, and, and possibly the not, not the best way to spend our resources. But what it might also indicate is that we have a great opportunity to install multimodal infrastructure. So let's talk about multimodal level of service. There are different methodologies out there we can conclude that when developing your framework, the goal is to provide a well-rounded roadway performance measure that emphasizes person throughput. So while over the last 20 years, there has been a growing interest and, and methods in practice and in development, there is a consensus that a combined multimodal level of service metric of all modes might dilute the results and it's not recommended or a favorable approach. So to the right, you can see that there has been thought on what multimodal level of service might look like in different contextual settings, whether it's a local street, an urban activity center, or a commuter corridor. An appropriate approach to multimodal level of service might look like a sliding scale, like you see in the image. Let's take, for example, bicycle level of service. Peter Firth in 2012 developed a, a concept of four different types of user categories for identifying level of stress, level of traffic stress. Further developed and adopted, Bellevue Washington published their bicycle level of traffic stress methodology as seen here. Emphasizing speed and volume They've come up with recommended bicycle facilities based on the user categories of LTS 1 through 4 that you can see in the upper right hand corner. Let's take a closer look at LTS 4. It's the strong and fearless category. These users make up about 1% of the population and are generally comfortable riding with or without a bicycle facility. So taking this user based and traffic stress approach. This enables us to design bicycle infrastructure to maximize potential users with an equity based approach. As we look at pedestrian level of service, for example, the emphasis tends to be on sidewalk width, buffers from traffic, um, connectivity and crossings to facilitate movement. Accessibility to pedestrian infrastructure and safe mobility is key to the quality of experience, but other factors like ADA compliance and clear space, shade, available amenities in the furniture zone, and curbside management may also be key additional qualities to elevate adoption rates and to facilitate mode shift. This methodology ensures equity considerations in a context sensitive approach. And I'm going to add that ADA compliance is a requirement that we have. So we need to make sure that we're updating our infrastructure to become ADA compliant. So what are the considerations when becoming multimodal? We've talked about multimodal level of service, but what about counts? FDOT has implemented a bicycle and pedestrian count program to gather baseline information. This is information that we really don't have here in Florida. So interestingly, unlike vehicular level of service, the perceptions of pedestrian and bicycle level of service tend to look at more users as a positive indicator of level of service rather than something that might decrease your level of service. However, connectivity and proximity to destinations play a very big role in adoption rates and whether someone decides to walk or bike to a location or even access transit. Safety has had an increasing presence in multimodal planning with the adoptions of policies like Vision Zero, Target Zero, and Road to Zero, with speed management being a huge component in the safety discussion. And I'll get into um, Vision Zero, Target Zero, and Road to Zero a little bit more later. So let's talk about safety. 
Recent research has looked into perceptions of safety and the literature has documented the importance of the perception of safety and the availability of infrastructure and design. While speed management strategies and policies continue to be developed and designed. Previously, I mentioned Vision Zero. So Vision Zero is a global movement to eliminate all deadly and severe injury traffic crashes starting in Sweden and first adopted statewide, uh, stateside in New York City. The adoption of Vision Zero policies and programs are increasing nationwide. And the goal of zero deaths and injuries have been adopted into state and federal policies such as Target Zero and Road to Zero. Generally speaking, Vision Zero has been adopted by cities and counties and some MPOs, but the states uh, adopt Target Zero. So how does Vision Zero differ? It, re it represents a shift in thinking. So crashes are, are not accidents. We say crashes instead of accidents. Traffic deaths are preventable. Saving lives is not expensive. And we employ a safe system approach. So what does a safe system approach include? It has safe roads, safe speeds, safe vehicles, and safe roadway users. But what does that really look like? So a safe roadway user may be one that uses seatbelts, one that drives the speed limit, a bicyclist or pedestrian that utilizes predictive behavior, such as crossing at crosswalks with walk signals, or riding your bicycle with the direction of traffic rather than facing traffic. Safe vehicles may include requiring large trucks to install truck side guards to protect vehicles, bicyclists, and pedestrians from side impacts or turning movements. Or we can talk about vehicles adoption of lane departure warnings. Safe roadways may have protected intersections or designed mid-block crossings with pedestrian crossing devices. And safe speeds may look like designing for target speeds, speeds that are appropriate for the context of the roadway and the environment. So what you see here on the slide is um, that Florida Department of Transportation's uh, strategic, strategic Highway Safety Plan has adopted safe systems approach as part of their strategies to enhance safety in Florida. And this is a big, um, a big deal. But FAU, you all have some of the uh, greatest examples of research for safe systems approach. So for more information about safe systems, I encourage you to look at examples from your own faculty. So what about complete streets? We've all heard a lot about complete streets, especially since the early uh, 2010s. So Initially, um, when I first heard about complete streets, it was generally described as a livable street designed for all users and all modes, regardless of ability or mode of travel. Um, and the conversations around complete streets continue to evolve. Organizations like the National Complete Streets Coalition are calling for an update to complete streets policies as discussions around equity, speed, and safety continue to grow and develop. Complete streets policies are more closely aligning with policies like Vision Zero and a safe system approach, and a recognition that there is no singular design prescription for complete streets. So each one is unique in response to the community context. And a complete street may also include infrastructure beyond just the ped and bike environment, such as bus only lanes, uh, comfortable and accessible public trans uh, transportation stops, frequent and safe crossing opportunities. And it might also have narrow lanes to encourage uh, more appropriate speeds. So when we're looking at comp updating complete streets policies, what we're starting to notice is that there's a conversation of about, okay, not only do we want to get um, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, but we want it to be safe. So four foot or five foot bike lanes might not be a 
appropriate for all roadways. And we're starting conversations about direct routes versus low stress routes and how can those work together to provide a more complete network for um, bicyclists and pedestrians and uh, creating a network that you can access transit safely. Further, there's integrations of greenways and neighborhood greenways or bicycle boulevards that are helping us solve these issues um, and some creative signalization that can help us facilitate crossings. Altogether, there are many different methodologies to uh, assess connectivity, which is going to be key to not only assessing our performance of our bicycle and pedestrian and alternative transportation modes, but it's going to give us a better picture of what our network looks like and how it functions. So let's move on and talk about um, how emerging mobility and mobility as a service fits into the multimodal landscape. So. What we've heard a lot more about is that um, dockless mobility or docked mobility, such as bike share, the standard or e-assist bikes and e-scooters can help um, play a role in solving the first last mile um, dilemma that we often hear with. So I want to be able to highlight a little bit more about um, how micro mobility was a disruptor but how it has also had a high success rate for adoption and trip use. And I'll be highlighting Fort Lauderdale. So Fort Lauderdale regulated um, micromobility, dockless micromobility, the e-scooters by, um, by local ordinance. And the e-scooters ended up averaging a trip length less than two miles, which is pretty standard. Maybe some of Fort Lauderdale's trips were a little bit longer than some of the, the other cities out there. But what they did do is they averaged over 100,000 trips per month and 75% of surveyed riders reported that their e-scooter ride replaced a vehicular trip. And that could have been a personal uh, vehicle trip or it could have been um, an Uber or a Lyft or a taxi ride. So when we start thinking about um, mobility as a service and some of the challenges that um, that we've seen curbside management tends to be a hot topic um, and I'm, I'm talking about the area of the space in front and behind the back of the curb and so what we have experienced is that sometimes say for example e-scooters in a conflict of um, keeping a clear space uh, where do we dock the scooters where do we allow them to park and figuring out where that is, but also balancing, um, you know, taxi and rideshare drop off um, with Uber, Lyft, or um, taxis. And then another thing that we have seen is that there is an increase um, in injuries initially. So while e scooters presented an unexpected increase in injuries initially, it may have highlighted the need for better vehicle design and uh, highlighted the imperfections and lacking safe and connected infrastructure that we see day to day. Oh, and I also would like to make mention um, that there is conversations that bike lanes might be rebranded as micro mobility lanes. So that's also something to keep in mind. Um, in mind. So how does all of this relate to health? So active transportation, walking, biking, transit use, and available, availability of infrastructure can play a big role on fighting our obesity epidemic, promote healthy behaviors, and increase accessibility to basic needs and services. So when we take a closer look at obesity, the estimated annual healthcare costs of obesity-related illnesses are over $190 billion, or nearly 21% 20, of annual medical spending in the United States. But if we were able to get the 10 cities with the highest obesity rates to cut their obesity rates down to the national average, we could save up to $500 million in healthcare costs each year. And that's, that's huge. That's a big role that we can play as planners and engineers. And so when we look to the literature to see 
um, what the literature has said about this. We, we see that uh, Dr. Larry Frank found that for each additional hour spent in a car per day was associated with a 6% increase in the likelihood of safety. And if you think about it in terms of, okay, my commute to work is 30 minutes. So I'm driving to work for 30 minutes and I'm driving home from work for 30 minutes, maybe longer. Well, that's increasing our risk for, um, for obesity and obesity related illnesses. But conversely, each additional kilometer spent walking was correlated with a 4.8% reduction in the likelihood of obesity. So this kind of gives you a little bit more um, context in terms of active transportation versus more sedentary forms of transportation. And what about transit? When we look at transit, okay, that's another place where we might be sitting for a long duration, but what we did find, um, and one of your own faculty, Besser, um, Americans who use transit spend a median of 19 minutes daily walking to and from transit. So about 30% achieve 30 minutes of physical activity uh, every day. And it's important to note that the American Surgeon General recommends that uh, adults achieve 150 minutes per week. And so walking to transit on a daily basis for the work week uh, helps you achieve those minimum recommended minutes of physical activity. And further encouraging people to use public transit increases physical activity and reduces sedentary time. So what we can conclude is that designing for multimodal infrastructure to facilitate accessibility and mobility to destinations this can really help us improve the health of our communities and increase the productivity of our transportation system at the same time. Thank you so much for having me. Questions, comments, discussion? Thank you, Josette. Um, that was a great presentation. We will be taking any questions and you can either send your questions to the to the, the chat, or you can unmute yourself and ask out loud, whatever you feel more comfortable with. Do we have any questions? Anything about the presentation? Yeah, this is Mark Plass at the Florida Department of Transportation. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, well, first off, I'd like to congratulate Josette on an excellent presentation. She and I work together very closely on a variety of topics. And I will say that uh, when I first met Josette, I wasn't exactly sold on some of the things that she presented today. But over time, I think uh, through her uh, patient education of me and just uh, me becoming increasingly aware of uh, the realities of redevelopment and the realities of mobility, uh, you know, what I see here today really to me is increasingly the future of what uh, the Department of Transportation and I am the District Traffic Operations Engineer for District 4, which includes Broward County. Uh, but but this, this is an area that my office in particular, as well as our planning and design offices, needs, needs to focus more and needs to reflect increasingly in the products and services that we generate. So, um, you know, just said, I've told you this before, and I'll tell you again, I want to continue to work with you and your staff uh, to, to begin to make this increasingly a reality. Um, I will say that one of the things that, that, that I was, uh, you know, inspired to start thinking about after thinking about these topics for the last few years is something that we in my office call uh, context sensitive traffic control. And so one of the things that my office does is we work with Broward County traffic engineering to um, develop uh, traffic signal operational plans uh, to move increasingly multimodal traffic on a pretty complicated network in Broward County. Broward County's got about 1,800 signalized intersections. I, I think the city of Fort Lauderdale probably has about 300, pretty dense signalization in the downtown area. A lot of transit users, increasing bicyclists, more people walking. And so what, what I've been trying to um, impress my staff on is the idea that traffic signal control isn't anymore just about moving large volumes of cars at a high rate of speed from point A to point B, which frankly it was for a long time. Now it's really taking a look at all the road users and how do we not only enhance their mobility, but make their forms of mobility more attractive uh, to use. 
And so we're starting to look at some innovative ways of operating pedestrian signals to increase uh, or uh, traffic signals to increase pedestrian mobility and things of that nature. And you know, perhaps that could be a topic of a future presentation that Josette and I can perhaps give to this group. Anyway, thanks for the opportunity to make comments. Certainly, and thank you so much, Mark. Uh, I will say that FDOT, oh, we we really have valued the um, the partnerships that we've had, and I really truly believe that together with FDOT, the Broward MPO, and our municipalities in Broward County, we have a really great opportunity to do a lot of creative implementations and really enhance the multimodal network. Um, so it's it's been a pleasure and, and thank you so much for all the praise, Margaret. That really means a lot to me. Thank you for your comments. Um, for the next question, we have Valentina. Valentina, do you want to unmute yourself? Join us with the with the discussion. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, so being in Florida, I have noticed that most streets have paved shoulders and not bike lanes, or at least not many bike lanes. Uh, what do you think the government has used their funds mostly for paved shoulders and not bike lanes? So, I actually think that this is a more complex question than, um, than, than people really think. So, when it comes to the paved shoulders, you know, really putting in good bicycle infrastructure, it takes a really long time and what people don't realize, um, and, and probably more of the general population, is that the planning process and, and getting projects designed and implemented, it takes a long time. So while you might see all this shoulder space that might be great for, um, say, bicycle infrastructure, it, it's more likely to be a, a part of the process of this is going to be a future project that we're programming to be done in the future. Um, what I will say is that I do think that there is um, a, a little bit of a lack of understanding from the general public that, you know, paved shoulders are sometimes paved shoulders and sometimes they're bike lanes. And the difference between a paved shoulder and a bike lane might be the actual designation or marking of a bicycle symbol or a sign. So um, I do think that, you know, while there are paved shoulders out there, there are opportunities um, and we can strategically create a wider bike lane if we're able to reduce um, lane width. And usually that will come on with a resurfacing process. Um, and so uh, there are, a tremendous number of projects and opportunities, not only through FDOT's work program, but Broward County's Penny for Transportation Surtax program. And I just really look forward to the opportunity to convert that, that space that seems to be underutilized into a space that people can really inhabit and move in and um, enhance our multimodal network with. Thank Great. you. For thank you just your, yes, thank you for your question and the answer. Um, our next question is from Andrea. There have been concerns raised regarding vision zero and racial equity. Can a safe systems approach be consistent with a reduced emphasis on enforcement? That's a great question. So there has obviously been a lot of conversation about equity and enforcement initially was a big component of vision zero. While it seems like it might not be as highly emphasized now, um, but what we can do for equity is we can make sure that when we're looking at the high injury network, we're doing those demographic analyses and really looking at the communities of people in color, people of color, low income, and making sure that we're creating safe opportunities for folks to move around the transportation system. Um, so one of the things that I would like to highlight about the enforcement, and this is something that I had an opportunity to discuss with um, the city of Philadelphia, and what they said was basically, um, 
we use data and data uh, as evidence to do analyses and um, potentially to target where we're going to do enforcement. And unfortunately, um, populations of color have had disproportionate impacts as being the victims of these um, these fatal and severe injuries. But we've also created this situation where we're looking at crime, we're looking at traffic crashes, and we're looking at the data sets that we have available. And what we're doing unintentionally is further targeting those areas and over policing and over enforcing in those areas that creates a more disproportional impact to those communities. So you have to be very, very careful when you're using enforcement. I do still think that there's a role that enforcement plays. Um, while some of those strategies like using um, speed radar, uh, you know, speed radar or um, red light cameras, those are ways that we take out the stereotypes out of the equation. And those are ways that we can do enforcement that takes away um, the question of equity. But, you know, with that said, we also live in a state that does not allow um, uh, speed radar, uh, automated speed radar detection. And there have been ongoing um, kind of policies and litigation as to whether or not the red light cameras are going to be allowable. So I think enforcement plays a really interesting conversation. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it it moves forward in the discussion. But I think I think the way that we should start looking at it is that there is also additional opportunities rather than having police officers uh, pull people over for say speeding. You can install speed radars um, like uh, traffic feedback signs that can give you a cue as to whether or not you are going over the speed limit. So, for example, on Las Olas in the city of Fort Lauderdale, they tried out a new. So, if you are going over the 25 mile an hour speed limit, it was actually giving you a red unhappy face. And it was kind of trying to introduce a little bit more of like, psychology and sociology, like, you know, what are people's emotional connections to getting feedback like that? So that is another way to do enforcement that's a little bit out of the box um, and doesn't involve a police officer. So I think that there is a way that we can still do enforcement, but it looks very differently. Thank you for your answer. Um, we have another question from Giri. Great presentation, she said. Can you present, can you please add any examples of Vision Zero projects being taken up in Fort Lauderdale? Yes. So there is a really great project that um, I actually can go back to it in my slides. Let me get there. Okay, I just passed it. Okay, so this is actually old Dixie Highway. And before doing this roadway project, there are people recorded going as fast as 60 miles an hour on this road. And it's really a road that was initially um, had speed limits of 30 to 35 mile an hour. But it was a very straight road, which presented way too much temptation to go fast. So what ended up happening, um, and, and this is before my time at the city of Fort Lauderdale, but the Broward NPO and FDOT and the city of Fort Lauderdale and the community worked together to re-envision this road. And what they ended up doing was a series of raised crosswalks. They added bike lanes. So the, um, the vehicular lanes are more narrow now. They added raised intersections, raised intersection roundabouts. Um, and what you've seen is actually this dramatic decrease in speeding and more of a compliance of the speed limit. And so when I went out there with actually 
um, an FAU intern at the time. We went out with a speed radar gun and we were able to take an average um, of the speeds and we went out in two durations. Um, and what we found was, you know, whereas our fastest speed before um, was recorded in the 60s, our average speed was now 28, which was a little it, way more uh, appropriate for that roadway. I believe our fastest speed that we saw was um, 38 miles an hour, which is still not what you want to see, but it's a lot better than the alternative. So there are lots of examples of great projects out there. This is one of the ones that I've really enjoyed. I've been able to bike that route and I've seen a lot more people getting out of their houses and biking and walking along this corridor where you wouldn't have seen that before. And it's really transformed the community. So I would, I would certainly highlight that one. Las Olas Boulevard also put in a pilot project where they put in um, parking protected bike lanes and that has been pretty successful. I encourage you to go see those. Um, and there are some other projects around the city that you can see. Uh, but it's, it's, it's great to see more of a multimodal environment in, um, in Broward County. And I, I hope you all will experience it, um, at your own time. Thank you. Um, another question from Bill, how is DOT, the county and local communities changing their thinking on level of service? Given that land development project approvals or disapprovals have been largely based on the traditional level of service methods and criteria for the past 50 years, there seems to be a hesitancy to accept a level of service E or lower for vehicle operating conditions, even if accommodating better bike, pedestrian, and transit. And it, it is a really big conversation that we've had. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because, um, you know, when I was at the city of Fort Lauderdale and we were looking at our um, the Fort Lauderdale comprehensive plan, Fort Lauderdale really wanted to be a bit more progressive, um, but they weren't able to have a different level of service or um, than than what the what Broward County was. So it had to be somewhat in line with what Broward County has. And then also with what the state has. So it's been, it's because it's codified, there's um, challenges to changing the status quo, but that doesn't mean that, that it can't happen. So Fort Lauderdale um, has had conversations with the county. I believe they've also had conversations with the state and all of us um, to be able to discuss how can we incorporate multimodal. And it's been an interesting uh, um, kind of an investigation or research because you really can't compare vehicular level of service with bicycle level of service and pedestrian level of service because you're not comparing the same thing. And in fact, an interesting component of this is that level of, vehicular level of service was actually considered to be a quality of service from the driver's perspective. And so, if we think about level of service as a quality of service measure from the user's perspective, you really wouldn't want to combine those measures into, um, into one. But what you can do is revisit um, the sliding skills approach that ITE has. And as municipalities, county, and state, we can work together to develop a policy that works with, um, with us here. Um, so I will say that, you know, that's something that we're looking into and exploring and researching, and I really hope that it becomes a reality soon. Thank you. I will jump to Geary's comments just because it's about level of service. Your comment on the perception of level of service is interesting and believe it or not, there are not many level of service A, B, and C on arterial networks. They are more close to level of service E or F without adding an enhancing public transportation system, converting vehicle lanes to bike lanes is only making it worse for all road users. Please comment. So, I, you know, you're absolutely correct. We lived in an urban environment. Um, it's rare to see a level A through C. 
Um, there are some municipalities that I believe have level C um, in their comprehensive plans. As of last last time I looked, um, but you know, once you're able to have a complete network of multimodal that makes sense, I think you'll see that mode shift that we're looking for. Um, and while in the interim, it might not be helping the situation in the long term, once a complete network um, and we can get that modal shift. It seems like Josette has a, a network problem. Josette, can you hear us? Um, Valentina, can you hear Josette or is it a problem with my network? No, I, I can't hear her. It looks like we might have lost her for a few minutes. Yes. Just when just when she was going to give us the hundred percent secret to life, all of a sudden we lost her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's just wait a little bit. Um, through intersections along corridors, you know, we're increasing that speed, and there's really no reason why, with the sophistication that we have today in our vehicles. I mean, in 1950, when they were developing all the service, they didn't even have airbags. But when they started improving the uh, safety mechanisms and vehicles, the number of fatalities didn't go down. And that's another thing that we're dealing with today. Like with less traffic congestion, while it's, you know, easier to go fast and it's, it's nice not to be in traffic congestion, you also don't have the cues that slow you down to keep you going the speed limit. How many of you during the pandemic went on a trip to the grocery store or something like that and you found yourself going 10 miles over the speed limit, you didn't even realize it. So I think that there's an important consideration when we think about what our visual cues are when we're driving and how we respond to our environment. And I think that traffic, while we don't wanna be sitting in, um, just sitting in traffic. We don't want to be traffic, um, but there's an important consideration on vehicles being on the roadway with us to help us gauge how fast we're going and helping us keep us ourselves in check to be safe roadway users. Thank you. We lost you for, for a moment while you were talking, but I guess we're fine. Okay. <laughs> Um, we have one last question from Meng. Any quantitative research results in the US? You can take a look, a look at the Dutch experience. Certainly, and I think that when, when we start thinking about planning our multimodal networks, countries like, um, like you know, the Dutch experience, Amsterdam, um, even London, some of those places they have they have so much research and, and so much that we can use to help guide what we're doing here in the US. So I definitely think that international best practices are something that we should be looking forward to and reviewing as we, we do our multimodal um, planning and, and uh, designing and programming. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kaiser, would you like to make some last comments? Because we don't have any more um, questions. I would like to thank uh, Josette for the great presentation. I'm very impressed with what we, we are doing down in Southeast Florida to improve the quality of life. Um, I, I really I really enjoyed the question and answer discussion. I would like to thank the the group the group that they put this uh, webinar uh, together. And we are looking forward to see you in the next webinar that Aline is going to give you more information about the upcoming webinar. So that again, thank you. I really appreciate it for your time. I'm looking forward to see you again really soon. Thank you so much for having me.
Thank you, Josette, and uh, thank you all for participating and watching in our, our webinar.